name is Sierra Patterson. I am a second year medical student at Medical University of South Carolina. Today, I'm representing MUSC acute care and trauma surgeon, Dr. Mike Mala, as well as doctors Kyle Alexander, Brenton French, Edgar Rodas, and Stefan Leachel from Virginia Commonwealth University. I would like to start off by thanking the Southern Medical Association for this time and opportunity to present this case study. I will be presenting on a novel utilization of an atriocable shunt as damage control surgical technique for a juxtarenal inferior vena cava injury with associated complex pancreatic duodenal, colonic, and hepatic injuries. I have no disclosures. Injuries to the juxtarenal IVC are rare and often fatal due to the rapid exsanguination and anatomically difficult to expose. In 1968, Schrock first described the application of an atriocable shunt to temporize these injuries. The atriocable shunt is a shunt between the right atrium and the inferior vena cava to divert venous blood flow away from the liver in order to repair the IVC. More than half a century after its initial description, um, its reported uses still of success still remain limited. Alternative methods to control these injuries can be seen here, including venovenous bypass, isolation of the liver with superior and inferior hepatic, hepatic vascular clamping, or an atriocable shunt with an endotracheal tube instead of a chest tube. Once the shunt is secured into place, the IVC is typically repaired immediately with suturing, while the, and then the chest tube is removed. In this case, it, we highlight the novelty of its prolonged use of the atrio atriocable shunt in a patient with not only a complex juxtarenal IVC injury, but with multiple complex additional injuries, including to the colon, liver, pancreatic head, duodenum, and distal common bile duct. A 29-year-old male presents to the emergency department with mid-epigastric gunshot wounds. The patient's confused, diaphoretic, and complaining of the inability to lie flat. Physical exam showed significant tachycardia, tachypnea, and a narrow pulse pressure consistent with class three hemorrhagic shock. An additional penetrating wound was found on the patient's back. The fast ultrasound revealed minimal fluid in the pericardial window without obvious tamponade. The pa patient was rushed, rushed to surgery and the massive transfusion protocol was activated. In the OR, a midline laparotomy revealed a large volume hemoperitoneum. The bleeding originated primarily from the liver, ascending and transverse colon mesentery and the duodenum. The liver and right upper quadrant were packed to temporize these injuries and the transdiaphragmatic pericardial window was performed to rule out cardiac tamponade, which was negative. Suspecting an IVC injury, right medial visceral rotation was performed, revealing extensive bleeding from what appeared to be an at least 10 centimeter segment juxtarenal IVC injury as well as a large right renal vein laceration. A left thoracotomy was performed to clamp the descending aorta and a rapid right nephrectomy was done. The patient was still deteriorating hemodynamically at this point. Due to the proximal location of the IVC injury, ligation would have resulted in the loss of both kidneys. Therefore, the surgical team decided to temporize this injury with the placement of an atriocable shunt. A left, <clears throat> excuse me, the left thoracotomy was extended into a clamshell thoracotomy. This clamshell thoracotomy allowed for the placement of the atriocable shunt. A purse string suture was placed through the right auricle before incising for the placement of the tube into the IVC. The chest tube was successfully guided across the infrahepatic and juxtarenal injuries and secured distally with the renal. The patient was still ongoing blood loss with obvious worsening coagulopathy, hypothermia, and acidosis. Contemplating defeat sustaining life, a decision was made to leave the shunt in situ. The proximal portion of the chest tube was advanced all the way into the atrium with closure of the purse string suture in the right auricle. And the patient maintained perfusion and satisfactory cardiac output as the massive transfusion protocol and vasoactive support continued. The perihepatic and right retroperitoneum were packed and temporary abdominal and chest closure devices were placed. With ongoing resuscitation, the patient was taken to the interventional radiology suite where he underwent successful angioembolization. And um, as seen here in this image, the venogram demonstrated flow through the atriocable shunt with occlusion of the IVC surrounding the shunt. 
Once in the ICU, the surgical team analyzed the extent and severity of the injuries of the patient with additional critical care burden and uh, after the damage control surgery. They were summed up in the following way to give perspective with injuries to the liver, colon, pancreas, duodenum, common bile duct, which initially was not appreciated, but was suspected, and the right kidney and IVC. <clears throat> The critical illness burden is highlighted here. In this case, the, the ISS or injury severity score severely undermined the extent of this patient's injuries, especially taking into consideration the presence of the lethal triad, or was now being known as the um, lethal diamond or diamond is death, diamond of death, um, of, consisting of hypothermia, coagulopathy, acidosis, and hypocalcemia. With these ongoing factors, the best option is for the patient to immediately be taken to the ICU. And this is done through a very quick damage control, damage control procedure, as well as activating the transfusion protocols as quickly as possible to spare no time in the operating room and get the patient to the ICU for resuscitation as soon as possible. This would give the patient the best chance of survival. This is why in our case, the atrial cable shunt was left in place for the patient to become more stable before repairing the IVC. The temporary blood flow diversion provided by the shunt facilitated the resuscitation and stabilization of the patient and underwent they, as they underwent long, excuse me, as they underwent aggressive rewarming in the surgical trauma ICU. This shunt remained in place for about seven and a half hours before returning to the operating room. With the patient no longer hemodynamically unstable, coagulopathic, or actively bleeding, the IVC injury could be thoroughly inspected and repaired. The atriocaval shunt was removed carefully under transesophageal ultrasound guidance through the reopening of the previous atriotomy per string suture. The chest was then definitively closed. The patient underwent two subsequent GI surgeries consisting of a pancreatico duodenectomy and an ileostomy, a jejunal feeding tube placement, and finally the abdomen was closed. The patient continued on anticoagulation with heparin and to treat a not unexpected IVC thrombus, which was diagnosed postoperatively, and the patient's um, thrombus was resolved by hospital day 32, and the patient was discharged and sent home on hospital day 37. Approximately three months after the initial injury, the patient returned for an IVC venography and stenting to relieve the IVC, IVC stenosis, prevent swelling, and decrease thrombus risk. The patient continued recovering well and outpatient with anti coagulation for three more months. One year post-op, the patient underwent an ileostomy reversal for their final procedure. Injuries to the IVC are uncommon and highly morbid, representing about 3.8% of all vascular traumas with 40.5% mortality. Injuries to the suprarenal and retrohepatic IVC are even more infrequent and deadly due to difficulties in sur surgical exposure and rapid exsanguination during attempts at repair. Due to this highly lethal nature of the injury, it has coined the term an injury to the surgical soul. Perfuse hemorrhage from behind the liver, portahepatis, or lesser sac should rise suspicion, raise suspicion for a retrohepatic IVC injury, while right-sided retroperitoneal hemorrhage or an inframesocolic hematoma could suggest infrahepatic IVC injury, which was found in our patient. Control of the supercelic aorta can be useful adjunct to reduce hemorrhage in the area, although this was inaccessible in our patient due to the extension of the hematoma. Management of these injuries involves rapidly formulating an operative plan with an early call for experienced surgical assistance, coordination with anesthesia colleagues for prompt availability of a massive transfusion protocol and active rewarming of the patient. Total vascular isolation strategies have been reported to have a high survival rate when combined with selective aortic cross clamping, although in our case, further exposure and attempts at direct vascular control only resulted in massive bleeding. Ligation of the IVC is also an acceptable damage control option, although it is associated with a higher complication rate without mortality benefit compared to repair pri primary repair, and few survivors exist for suprarenal ligation. Endovascular stenting or occlusion of the injury site may also have been a successful successfully accomplished and would have been worth considering in our case. Injuries to the IVC, especially the juxtarenal and infrahepatic regions, again, are very challenging and often fatal. The shrock or atriocabial shunt is an alternative to managing these IVC injuries in situations with imminent exsanguination where conventional vascular control techniques are unlikely to be successful. The novelty of our case lies in 
the atrio cable shunt being left in place beyond the index of operation, remaining in place for seven and a half hours for subsequent venography, further resuscitation, and IVC repair following. To acknowledge such prolonged use of the shock shunt outside of the operating room has, to our knowledge, it has yet to been reported. Most um, more extensive case reporting would be required to evaluate this approach's efficacy and long-term outcomes in similar cases. These are my references, and I will take any questions. Thank you. All righty. Thank you so much, Sierra. Um, were any other methods of bypassing the portal system considered parasurgically, or was that kind of the, the first thing thought of to do? I think, um, let's see, sorry, I'm trying to get my Zoom back open. So I, I think in the moment um, they did consider ligation, but again, due to the proximity to the kidneys, it would have resulted in loss of both kidneys and the patient wouldn't have made it either way, considering they'd already lost one kidney. So it was um, the, the lead surgeon on the case had performed an atrial cable shunt surgery one time in the past where that, um, that procedure actually, the patient did not survive. But in this case, it seemed to be the best option for the patient's survival. So it was very quick decisions for the moment um, to try to get the best outcome for the patient. Great, thank you. And uh, is is there um, any literature on on what they're supposed to do as as far as anticoagulation after such a procedure, or is it kind of just general anticoagulation? So this patient was on um, IV heparin in the hospital and then oral heparin at home, um, but or oral anticoagulation at home. I have not. Um, I have not looked into the anticoagulation therapy as much, but it is definitely something that is of interest and I would uh, look I, into it I going forward it's more. A, it's, a, it's a pretty, pretty rare procedure to do. So, Sure. I do think that um, like, uh, it is high risk of thrombus after due to all the swelling in the IVC. So. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you.